that my oh, my bad. It's great to play on the No sled the dredge Come on run That broke him Yes. Ah, I'm glad you warmed me up. A lot of people ask me why I like fly fishing so much. And for me, it's a pretty simple answer. It's not just about being on the water. I think fly is an intriguing form of fishing. A lot of people think it's, it's up here, it's, it, it's highly technical, it's elite. It's not. You need to make it as simple. You need to make it to suit you, and, and that's what I've done. I'm an everyday sort of guy, and I've embraced fly, and, and uh, it's embraced me. Uh, it's given me some some really special moments in my life taking me to some amazing places. You know, and that may sound over the top, but it's true. You know, some of the things I've seen and some of the places I've been uh, is because of fly fishing. Some of the species I've targeted are because of fly fishing, and really, you can't target those species in those locations any other way than with fly. So it has this standalone uniqueness about it that's been able to give me special moments. Obviously, you're not just 
chucking a, a rod and reel into your car or into an aeroplane. You, you know, you get into the fly tying side of it and you tie some flies and you, you try different variations and before you know it, you're up till midnight and you're doing it night after night. And you know, that's part of it. That, that's part of any journey. You know, fly fishing, as I said, is not just about the hookup, not just about landing that fish. It's about so many different aspects along the way. fly fishing, when you meet other fly anglers, you find that is a, certainly a common thread um, among them. Everybody enjoys it, everybody likes to talk about it, everybody likes to share it. I don't think I've ever been on a trip where everybody hasn't swapped a few flies or lent somebody a rod or lent somebody a reel or been just as stoked to see somebody catch a permit as they would have been themselves. So, you know, it's little things like that that I really find in fly that have really connected me to it. Over the years as my techniques progressed, I guess it has got a little bit easier, but I would expect that the species bar has been risen and risen and uh, slowly I'm ticking them off and I think that I'm there. Yeah, that's it, you know, I don't have too many more on the list and then all of a sudden there's one more. Um, but that's great, you know, I guess I'm not a young man, but I'm not an old man and uh, you know, knowing life as it is, I think it's, uh, it's pretty important to really embrace and really enjoy every day on the water because I'm pretty sure there's a lot more fish behind me uh, than there is in front of me. So every fish I land is certainly a special one. Beautiful, beautiful. Let it sink, let it sink. Strip, 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 strip. Oh. Looked, got him, he looked at that. <laughs> he did look. Blue bastards that get up onto the flat are a fish that is entirely in the realm of fly fishermen. There is some suspicion that these fish that get up into the shallow water to feed are actually a different species from what we originally thought they were, which was Diagramma pictum or the painted sweet lip. There are samples of these in with the museums at the moment and they are trying to determine if they are actually a new and different species. What makes them so special for fly fishermen is the fact that they get up into very shallow water to feed. They tail when they feed and the water's shallow enough, their tails wave in the air, giving you a really specific target to throw at. And they are very, very fussy about what they'll eat. Can't throw better casts than that. They are so close, they're right in the fish's path. Ah, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Their history is fairly recent and very much involved with fly fishing. And a fellow in Western Australia uh, by the name of Lance Christie was being tormented by these fish that he couldn't catch. He was fairly new to fly fishing and he described them as these blue bastards of fish that I can't catch. And I went over and fished with Lance and he took me to this island where he'd been seeing them and on an incoming tide I managed to get one. At much the same time Alan Phyllis Kirk was catching them in Weeper and I wrote an article about them in Fly Life magazine in, it would have been about the year 2000 I suppose, uh, around that time and it was called Sweet Things and described the catching of these fish. The fishing of them accelerated pretty quickly after that. Uh, being 
really quite an available species, a slow moving species, a species that is comparatively easy to see compared to permit and even to golden for valley. Uh, makes them a target, I wouldn't say an easy target, but a very available target. Everything that has worked for them before is not working. Just not working. Whether the water here is a lot clearer than the water I usually fish for them in and therefore I need much smaller flies. But you know, that's a great shrimp pattern. Seeing them, finding them, and actually getting a fly in front of them is the relatively easy part. The hard part is getting them to actually eat that fly. And uh, these Great Barrier Reef Blue Bastards, I've seen a few caught now. I haven't caught one myself in this part of the world. I've caught them all around Australia, but not in this part of the world. Bastard! For some reason, I think that clear oceanic water uh, has made my presentations that I use elsewhere ineffective. My hands are shaking, I'm struggling to tie the knot. Not a lot of things make my hands shake. These bastards do. Can you tell me another circumstance where you have to do a roll cast with bead chain eyes to a to a 10 kilo saltwater fish? No. No, no. All the people I know who have caught them here are probably first time blue bastard catchers. So they're doing something slightly different that I'm not doing. I'm perhaps doing it wrong. I may be trying too hard, whereas they're throwing a fly in there and bingo, the fish are eating it. I'm using the same fly. So they can be an enormously frustrating fish from that perspective. They still really, really test you. I landed that 10 feet from it. I thought this fish could be quite possibly uh, far beyond my reach, so much so um, it probably wasn't even on my list. At times you need to back yourself and you need to put it on your list, so I did. Um, obviously being with, with Peter Morse, one of the best in the business who'd fished for him many times before, and if ever there was a time it was now. So we chase these things and they are an unbelievably tough fish. It's probably the toughest species I've ever fished for. You know, you're up here on the Great Barrier Reef, it is ultra clear, oceanic water. These fish, they leave the, the reef edge, they come onto the flats to feed and they don't leave that reef edge for, for probably more than 20 metres at times. So many fly changes, so many techniques, you know. At times, both of us were on our knees, you know, trying to keep a low profile, trying not to thump on the sand or, or walk through the water. You've got to put it in front of him. You don't want to put it too far, because he'll just turn around it. You want it so it sinks right in front of his lips. And I guess I, I saw one come around the corner. I had three shots at it. The last shot landed right on his forehead. At the time, I thought it was too close to him. I'm trying to judge the sink rate of the fly. I was pretty much almost down on my knees, um, and it was just a really small little twitch. I'm trying to remember what, what, what Peter told me in my mind, mate. Keep it slow, keep it short. And I just gave it a couple of little twitches, and as I looked up, I just saw the fish kick a little bit, saw the tail flick, and the line go tight, and bang, I was on. And, you know, this fish is probably 10 metres from the reef and then 10 metres to me to the shore. So this fish up and went and really strong.
you're privileged to, to hold one, to catch one. You're standing in one of the seven wonders of the world and, and in my view, probably just caught one of the, the seven wonders of the fly fishing world. Some people could very well go home in a straitjacket because of the I mean, I'm at the point after fishing for them for a couple of days, burning up a couple of days throwing flies at these things. I'm, I'm just about due for a straitjacket myself. I want to get away from them, even though I love the challenge. I hate them. I hate them. Until next time. Yeah, I guess fly fishing really does define who I am. It's what I've done for the last 40 years, catching new species of fish and going to new destinations always excites me. But also working out, um, working out difficult situations, trying to catch fish that aren't on the radar of most fly fishermen. I mean, I love that, that the challenge of trying to work things out. I call it joining the dots, you know? You might take something that I learned on a trout stream in New Zealand and apply it to a blue hole out here on the Great Barrier Reef. And that might apply it to, to fly fishing for marlin. You know, all of these things link up. And for me, the challenge is finding those common links all the time. And then of course, writing about them and teaching people about them. I love teaching fly casting probably more than any of it. I like getting great photos and writing good stories, but I really enjoy teaching fly casting. I love it when a student of mine gets it, gets the feel, get, puts the rod in his hand, someone who's never fly cast before, and after a few minutes, they're starting to throw really nice loops, and they understand the importance of the loop. Yep, that's one, that's one for sure. Yep, that's a little permit. There are also all the peripheral challenges of fly tying, of knots and rigs and knowing which line to use when. It's a sport that, that has no age barriers, you know. I'm 60 this year. I'm not slowing down. Uh, next year is even busier than this year was. Hello, you gorgeous thing. One of the things I really love about fly fishing, and flats fishing in particular, is it teaches you to slow down. It teaches you to take it step by step, be extremely aware of what's going on around you, the movements, even the sounds, the shapes, all of that sort of thing. I get that from fly fishing and I get it from surfing, so I'm very fortunate to be able to have found two things that have given me that satisfaction within my life and everybody should have a place or, or something in their life that can take them somewhere else and remove them from there every day and I'm privileged to have two of those and I'm pretty sure that I've got plenty of special moments to come in my life. The blue holes are a depression in large areas of reef, a deeper depression. I don't know how unique they are uh, to this part of the world, but they're certainly one of the features that keep me coming back. I, I, I dreamt of fishing the blue holes from the last time I was here. I couldn't wait to get back. The main area of reef might be a metre to a metre and a half underwater. The, the blue holes can be up to five or six metres deep and of course, on low tide, all the fish aggregate in those holes. They hold an incredible population of fish. The water is so clear, it's absolutely oceanic. And the bulk of the fishing is sight fishing. You're seeing a lot of the fish before they even eat the fly in that crystal clear, five metre deep water. 
You can bend rods on, on uh, red bass all day long. I mean, you bend rods until your arms ache, your hand hurts from casting, your fingers are burned from stripping line. So that aspect of it is fantastic, but it's the size and the mix of species that you find in there that is so exciting. Get him out, mate, get him out. <laughs> yes! I don't know what it is, but it's coming out of there. Just the variety of fish and the colours and the, the landscape or the seascape that you're in. This shimmering blue hole with bommies and beautiful blue coral and then out of it coming these incredibly exotic fish. Come on, come on! Holy... Ah. Holy... He's got me in there, I think. Add some pressure on it. No! Yes! Woo! That was on my wish list. Wow! Look at the stripes around the head. Yeah. A lot of grunting, mate. Right. Down for the race! <laughs> Get a strip! Big top. Yes! Oh ha! Oh ha, baby! That's a better red bass. Yes! Ah! Come sooner, mate. <laughs> He's on your fly! Oh, you sidecast to that one. I oh, did. A little bit shy. No, they're not. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> I live in the Blue Mountains and it's a very famous rock climbing area with big escarpments. And I bought a book on rock climbing because I was going to do some photography. And there's a, a very famous climb there called Beaten, Bullied, Broken and Buggered. That's what the rock climbers call it. And I reckon that's what they should call some of these blue holes out here. Each of these blue holes could have their own name. And by the end of the day, that is how you feel. You have been bullied, beaten, you will be bruised, and you will be buggered. Oh, oh, trout! Big bastard! Big, big trout! Can't get a wrap! Oh, fiddle line barns! Come here! Oh, oh gotcha. <laughs> that was a big, big trout. I had no chance.